I invite you to join me in our call to worship, which you'll find in your bulletin on page one. Come in from the night. It is a new day, and this is for a Take off your jacket. Let the weight fall off your shoulders. For here you are known. Here you are known. Come in from the fear. We can do anything together. We can survive together. When the world unravels from under our feet, Come and do this when nothing around us seems the same, Come and do this God is here. You are home. You will never be alone. Let us worship the God who leads us together. And this was not written for California. Take off the jacket. <laughs> let us join together, let us combine our voices, our hearts and minds and confess to God our sins, our shortcomings, our omissions and just the things we do and not do. Holy God, we have been angry because we see suffering and we don't understand. We have been skeptical. Because we know a heartbreak that doesn't seem fair. We have withheld love because sacrifice only feels real when it is our own. Forgive us for forgetting that you created the heavens and the earth. Forgive us for withholding our pain from you. Forgive us for thinking that we know everything. When the world falls apart around us, when love unravels and life slowly fails, Draw us in, show us grace, for you gave the wind its weight, and you gave our bodies life. Forgive us for forgetting that. Amen. God loves you, and you, and you, every one of us. And God loves us despite everything that we do or not do. God loves us because God is love. And this is how we can live and thrive. And because of Jesus Christ, we also know that and we know that God forgives our sins. So those are the good news. Amen. And let's sing together. <laughs> Doesn't this feel good?
singing together. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Bruce, for leading us in song. And now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Scripture lesson is from the Job 28th chapter, a reading from the book of Job. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Mortals do not know the way to it, and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not in me. It cannot be gotten for gold, and silver cannot be weighed out at, as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, or precious onyx, or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for, gold, for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and Beth say, we have heard a rumor of it in our ears. God understands the way to it and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to humankind, truly the fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I bet you expected to see Miss Carol this morning. Well, she's a little bit under the weather, so I'm bringing you the message, a message about grace. This morning we heard a message in our Bible verse from Job, where he's trying to understand what his friend Bildad is saying. He says that suffering is a form of punishment and that the wicked suffer, but will be rewarded if they turn to God. Now, I have an experiment to do this morning. 
and I wish you were here to help me with it. I have this Ziploc bag filled with water. And yes, I'm holding it over my computer. Now I also have a pencil. What happens when I stick this pencil into this bag of water? Is the water going to come out? Let's see. Poke it through. Poke it through to the other side. Look, the water is not coming out. Let's try it again. Got it in. Got it through. And look. Oh, there's a little bit of a leak there. I must not have pushed it fast enough. I'm going to set this bag of water down. So, we saw that when we stuck the pencil in, at least the first time, no water came out. And everything stayed in place. When we did it the second time, a little bit leaked out. The pencils acted as a plug to keep the water from coming out. Now, well, what does this have to do with us? Well, sometimes things, bad things happen in our lives, kind of like the sharp pencils. They poke right through and they hurt us. Now, how does this relate to God? Well, sometimes he, there are bad things that happen to us, but the bad things are done for good. Like the bag that uses the sharp pencils to block the holes so they don't leak. God takes the bad things in our lives, the things that hurt us, and uses them to help make us stronger. He gives us grace, not because of what we do or because we earn it. It's just to the glory of God, because we love God, that we get that grace. We get that love from God. Well, I've had a hard time in my life the past couple of years. As some of you know, I had cancer. And I had to go through a lot of suffering. Kind of like that bag. It was getting suffering because it was getting poked. It was getting hurt. Just like we get hurt by our friends sometimes. And I thought, God, why are you doing this to me? It hurts. And I just didn't feel that it was, God was being nice to me. So I prayed about it and I got through it and here I am today. And what has God done for me? He's given me somebody to share that story with, somebody who is going through the same thing I went through. That's what I was meant to do. I was meant to be here for my friend who is suffering. Just like it's hard to understand why the bag didn't leak, it's hard to understand how God can possibly bring some good out of the bad things in our lives. Sometimes we don't understand it for a long, long time, but we can trust in God that he loves us and is taking care of us. That is called grace. Now, you know how every week Miss Carol asks you to send her a color? I want you to send her the color of grace. What is your color of grace? You can email her. You can text her. You can call her. You can put it in the chat. Just let her know your color of grace, your color of God's love. Will you pray with me? Lord, I know you look after us day and night. I know sometimes we question the bad things that happen when you're supposed to be taking care of us. But we know your grace is there forever. We don't have to do anything, but you give it to us graciously. You give it to us in abundance. In your name we pray, amen. Bye-bye. Have a good week. So this week, 
I just celebrated my 58th birthday. The older birthday. Yeah, back to back with Anna. But the applause wasn't the thing. The older I get, the messier life feels to me. The older I get, the more I appreciate, actually, a group of biblical authors called wisdom literature. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Psalmist, and the book of Job. They are part of that body of literature called wisdom literature. They all ask us unsettling questions that feel rather familiar to many of us. Questions like, why do some people get healed and some people don't? Why do some people leap and land on their feet while others tumble all the way down? Why do some babies die in their cribs and some bitter souls live to see their great-grandchildren? Why were some, let's spin this on, why were some Louisiana homes destroyed by Hurricane Laura and others remained untouched by the winds? Does God indeed have a secret? providential plan for our lives in which disastrous setbacks are no more than necessary obstacles on our way to ultimate deliverance? And finally, are there spiritual techniques that we can embrace? Techniques that will lead to prosperity, happiness, and contentment, as certain prominent Christian TV personalities claim. Today's scripture lesson from the book of Job could not come at a better time for us, for it is part of a biblical book that ponders the problem of how one can say that God is just in light of the suffering that surrounds us. The book of Job has a very simple structure. There is a prose prologue of two chapters, first on earth, then in heaven, and there is at the other end of the book a prose epilogue. Where, um, and in between are 39 long chapters of poetry. And we had one of those chapters, or part of one chapter, chapter 28, which is one of the most famous. And those 39 chapters are both monologues and dialogues. The plot of Job's story is simple. Job is a righteous man, married, with children. He is wealthy, successful in life. Satan challenges, Satan who is one of the angels surrounding God, challenges God. Um, saying that humans are good only because they hope to get rewarded for their righteous living. Even a man as righteous as Job will be good only as long as his life is happy. Once everything that gives him happiness is taken away, Job too will abandon God. That's what Satan says. So God agrees to an experiment and the drama begins. Gradually, Job loses everything, his wealth, his health, children, and his standing in the community. His friends, there are three of them, plead with him to admit that he must have done something wrong, to, something to offend God. Repent, and God will forgive, they insist. Job, though, won't give in to their pleas. While he agrees that God has the right to reward and punish, he is also angry at God for letting calamities happen. He never stops insisting on his righteousness and piety. Eventually, God himself speaks, pointing to his role in maintaining order in the entire universe. He alone, God alone, understands the workings of the cosmos and God alone has the ability to maintain it. The story then ends with God restoring and increasing Job's wealth and family. Job, Proverbs, the Psalms, and Ecclesiastes are different 
from the rest of the Old Testament. All the other Old Testament send, tell a story that begins with Adam and ends with Israel's return from exile in Babylon. Basically, the story goes something like this. God created humanity, but soon discovered that human beings are disobedient and do not live up to God's expectations. After trying out several other strategies, God picked one particular people to realize his goal for humanity. God entered a series of covenants with the ancestors of that people, delivered them from slavery, and gave them a land. God promised to remain present with them, with his people, if they were to remain faithful and live by the laws that God had given them. Obedience will result in presence in the land, and disobedience will result in exile from the land. That's basically the story of the Old Testament people, the mainstream of that story. Israel's dominant story is pretty simple. It is a story with a straightforward moral. Fear and serve God, and God's justice will reward you. Disobey and abandon God, and God will punish you. But for Psalms, and Ecclesiastes, and Job, and Proverbs, life doesn't see, didn't seem so simple. Life, according to them, is messy, is unpredictable, and often makes no sense at all. These four books take issue with Israel's dominant storyline. They conclude that life isn't that straightforward. They ask questions like, why do God, good people suffer? Why does God allow the wicked to prosper? Does anything in life really matter at all since we all will eventually die? And at that time, people didn't believe yet in an afterlife. So, what, and they ask, what keeps us from going mad? at the thought of our futile existence. There are no easy answers to questions like these. Take, for example, Job himself. If it were true that God punishes the wicked, then why, why did God allow Job's life to unravel? Job never gets a straight answer to the question why his life went down the drain. Other than God telling Job, I am God, the creator. You are not. You are human, Job. Pre present here on earth and for a few moments. You can't possibly comprehend how the universe works or my part in it. The script of the sacred story is fine as far as it goes, but this world and my place in it aren't limited to you, Job. You will not figure this out, Job. That's kind of what God seems to say to God, Job. All of the major world religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, and a few other isms, include moral teachings that tell people how to live worthy lives. Basically, all those moral teachings are grounded in the idea that there is a supreme being, a God, and that that God is merciful, good, and just. We must be good, all major world religions teach, because God is good. But if we look at the universe we inhabit, we don't see goodness. We see a distant, cold, empty space and endless cycles of destruction and rebirth. Nothing in that distant, cold, empty space suggests that there is a loving, righteous force at work in the universe if we look at the grand scale of things. Here on Earth, tsunamis take out coastlands and tens of thousands of lives, mudslides, storms, Floods and volcanoes hit with little or no warning. Our environment is hostile, and sentient beings kill and eat each other. The entire evolutionary process is fueled by suffering, death, and this extinction. 
on a massive scale. So what kind of God is this who seems to tolerate this clash of interest? A God who is good and just and expects the same from us, but whose universe operates by a different standard. The author of the book of Job tells us that our human thought process can get us only so far when it comes to God. At some point, God stops making sense to human minds. At that point, all human beings can do is to embrace God's mystery without understanding it. Despite everything Jesus has taught us about God, we have to admit that we often cannot make sense of God. We have to admit that there is no, that no easy answers exist to the problems of suffering. No formula that can adequately explain the justice of God. Our finite minds are too limited to grasp the divine. The issue is whether we will be able to live with this level of ambiguity. There are many who cannot live with it. Some end up abandoning faith in a supreme being altogether, while others embrace fundamentalist teachings which offer need, unambiguous answers for every theological and moral problem under the sun. The book of Job, Job is so precious because it models to us how people of faith can live with ambiguity and mystery. In the end, Job seems to understand and admit that his mind simply cannot grab, cannot understand God and the workings of the cosmos. During this time of wildfires, storms, floods, growing awareness of systemic racial injustice, unemployment, economic worries, and global pandemic, during this time when so much of our lives has been unraveling. It may be, simple enough, be simply be enough for us to know that God calls us to alleviate suffering rather than to ask whether or not God causes people's suffering. Amen. <laughs> Let us confess together with one heart, one voice, one mind, our faith in the triune God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of our lives. Amen. How long, O oh Lord? Every day we see images and hear stories of the devastating wildfires, raging fires, blackened forests, burned out homes, ash filled skies, traumatized animals, and families in emergency housing. We are filled with sorrow. Our soul is heavy with grief. How long will the fires last, O oh Lord? How long will the destruction and death continue? We are, are you, God? We grieve the loss of human life, of homes, animals, plants, and trees, and the scarring of the earth. We are saddened for all those affected by the fires. We are especially sad for those without enough homeowners insurance and the farm workers working outdoors in the smoke so that we have food to put on our table. We are sad for those whose house have been burglarized while they were evacuating and those firefighters who had property stolen while they were battling the flames. As Jesus wept for Jerusalem and the coming destruction of the temple, we weep for California. We are afraid because these fires are out of our control. We feel helpless and small. When will this torment end? How many lives will be affected by the fires? There is no end in sight. Will relief ever come? We look for someone to blame. Whose fault is this? Scientists have warned for decades of the dangers of climate change, yet not enough is done in response to their warnings. We are even angry with you, God. Can't you stop the fires by some miracle? Are you even listening? We know that pointing fingers will not help, but we are upset. Are you my anger I am ashamed. Are we partly to blame for these fires? We hold tightly to our comforts and conveniences, which contribute to higher carbon levels in the atmosphere. We are ashamed because we do not know how to help. Are you my shame and healing? I am grateful. We are thankful for the firefighters who work tirelessly to protect our and your people and all creation, for the volunteers and those who donate money, supplies, and their own homes to assist those in need, for the good news stories which, they, which spark hope. We are grateful for the rain when it comes. Turn my we cry to you in my helplessness as we witness the tragedy unfolding in our state. Come, Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of your love. Fill the hearts of your people and renew the face of the earth. Fill us with compassion and mercy to stand with our sisters and brothers affected by the fires. Give us strength to join in their suffering and bear witness to their pain. Bring fresh air to drive away the toxic fumes and ashen skies. Breathe new life into us. Inspire us with love to care for one another and the earth. Open the heavens, quench the flames, heal the parched land, and nourish our souls. Renew the face of the earth. Calm our anxi anxieties and fear. Lead us from the temptation to blame one another and become divided. May we be bearers of peace. Anoint and soothe the wounds of the victims, seen and unseen. May we be a balm to one another. At this point, I would like to mention all of the prayers on our prayer list. 
and, and as you can see, Allison, one of Karen Swanson's students, for Ken Bancroft, for Maddie Devereaux, for Linda, for Maynard Johnson, for Lois Sellers, for Lou Smith, for Rod Swanson, for Barbara Wammer, for Gary Peterson's hunting buddy, and all those we would name out loud or in the silence of our hearts at this time. Come Holy Spirit, as is the soothing balm. Listen to our inward groaning and give us words to speak in places of power. Speak through us that we may be prophets of love amid the kingdoms of selfishness and greed, that we may speak hope in times of despair. Come Holy Spirit, fill the land, fill our hearts, make us do it again. To you, O God, we entrust our sorrow, our sorrow, our fears, our anguish, as well as the people, the flora, and fauna of all areas that are devastated by wildfires. Help us to, to find consolation and to be grateful for the many gifts and joys present in the midst of this tragedy. Reveal to us the path of life. Fill us with love, guide us in hope, and lead us to act with mercy and compassion. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ is with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who made us who we are, we offer all of ourselves to you. Take our talents, our energy, and our joy, and use us to share your love. Take our mistakes, our regrets, and our pain, and use us to bring your healing. Magnify the gifts we will offer before you today to spread your peace in the world. Amen. Could I get some hand sanitizer, please? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O oh God. For in an everlasting covenant, you have promised to be our God through all generations. You called into existence things that did not exist, the universe and all that inhabits it. From Abraham and Sarah, you brought forth nations, calling them to walk before you in the righteousness that comes from faith. In your son, Jesus, you showed your compassion for the afflicted and taught us that real life is found by those who lose their life for your sake and for your gospel. Jesus was rejected by the religious leaders and killed, but three days later you raised him from the dead as Lord. Now, you justify all who put their faith in him, in you, through him counting us, it to us as righteousness and promising us the full riches of your grace when Christ comes again in glory. Therefore, we join our praises with the countless men and women before us, disciples and apostles, saints and martyrs, acclaiming your power and goodness in mind your might and compassion as we sing. He broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, 
He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Hold on one second. So come, for all is now ready. Um, Christ himself, the host at this meal, invites us to join him. And before we do so, um, let us let us pray from memory, as it is apparently not in the bulletin, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is Christ's table. He is the host, we are the guests. He invites each and every one present here who believes in him as the Savior and Lord to partake in this meal and to safely do that. You know by now our fantastic little cups that take a little bit of fumbling, but um, we'll get there. And we also now have individually wrapped gluten-free bread. So, yes. So... Come and follow the signs of the ushers. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for feeding us with this bread and juice. We give you thanks for coming to us with your own body and blood. May the elements of communion strengthen us and build us up. May they empower us to live lives of grace and love, worthy of the sacrifice of your son. And let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. And may the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless us and keep us. May God watch over us, keep us safe, and may God be with us, especially as we fail to comprehend his ways in the world. May he help us to just embrace the mystery of who he is. So let's go. Now go in peace.
to serve our risen Lord. Thanks be to your God.